Good afternoon. I am pleased to be with you today and to have the chance to introduce our next speaker in the Empire Lecture Series, Josiah Ober. My name is Nick Clark. I am a professor at Susquehanna University. Professor Ober is an American historian and classical political theorist. He holds the, and I'm, I'm going to pronounce this as best as my Nebraska upbringing allows me, the uh, Sakupolis Kunalakis Professorship in honor of Konstantin Mitsotakis, Chair of Classics and Political Science at Stanford University. His teaching and research links ancient Greek history and philosophy with modern political theory and practice. His topic today is the rise and fall of classical Greece. By applying the analytic tools of contemporary political science to newly collected data, Ober will explain the political breakthroughs that enabled Greece's rise to unexpected heights of economic and cultural accomplishment, how the city-states fell after Macedonians adapted Greek innovations, and how Greece's economy and culture survived that fall. Please join me in welcoming Josiah Ober. Thank you. Um, this is a uh, very um, a brief version um, of a book that is uh, about to come out uh, with uh, Princeton University Press. Uh, the idea um, uh, for political scientists, I think, behind the book uh, is that the relationship between economic and political change, um, which is a very big deal if you're interested in institutional economics, is usually explored through the historical cases from the 1500 to the present, uh, which of course leaves out most of recorded human history. So uh, there are a, there's a problem, I think, in limiting ourselves to these more recent cases, to the last 500 or so years of human history, uh, and that is the problem of confounding variables. The exploration and uh, exploitation of the new world, scientific and technological advances that are distinctive to this recent period of human history make it somewhat more difficult to identify how important institutions are in causing economic change. Um, so I think there's at least an a priori reason to want to test our theories um, against some um, out of sample um, uh, ancient histories. So uh, there are um, uh, at least some, uh, some reasons not to uh, address uh, uh, ancient uh, societies um, if you're a political scientist, um, and at least one of those is that uh, the work uh, that is available um, tends to be in strange languages um, uh, like uh, Greek and Latin uh, and Akkadian and so on. The kind of evidence uh, is likely to be unfamiliar, um, archaeology, uh, numismatics, epigraphy. Uh, the secondary literatures to which I have contributed, um, uh, I admit, are obscure um, and often uh, meant to be obscure, and P.S. there's no data. Um, um, so uh, uh, why bother uh, with anything before 1500? Um, the good news um, is that the world is changing. Uh, we now have uh, histories of antiquity that do employ uh, theories, models um, uh, uh, of contemporary forms of social science. Um, uh, the data that we have is indeed uh, sparse um, and noisy compared to certainly the data for the last uh, 100 years and uh, even the last 500 years, but I think, at least I'll argue, um, that it's now adequate for hypothesis testing. Um, this is uh, the Cambridge uh, Economic History of the Greco-Roman World, uh, uh, which is edited by m some of my Stanford colleagues, which really introduced the possibility of using modern social science methods for thinking about ancient history. So uh, social science uh, and ancient history has been the focus of a good deal of work recently um, on Roman history uh, and the Roman Empire, and this is really good and interesting work. Um, but uh, classical Greece offers us some really distinctive um, uh, and uh, interesting ways to think about institutional development 
the institutional form of the polis or the city-state, uh, the development of democracy as opposed to the kind of republican forms of organization uh, associated with Rome uh, are at least uh, uh, worthwhile uh, in dressing in their, for their own uh, intrinsic interest. And the Greek world turns out to be surprisingly data rich. Uh, we didn't have any way to organize that data until fairly recently. We now have it with the work uh, of this remarkable inventory of archaic and classical city-states uh, put together by Mons Hansen and his collaborators uh, in Copenhagen. Evidence for um, 1,035 Greek city-states um, from uh, the period of 800 to 323 BCE. Uh, so the Greek world turns out to be what we can call a market-like ecology of states. Uh, the world of the Greek city-states is the largest um, uh, and the best documented uh, ecology of city-states um, uh, that we have. It's a particularly prominent example of what um, some social scientists call peer polity interaction um, uh, and is a system of many uh, small states. So uh, the history of the Greek world allows us to test um, uh, various uh, empirical um, claims. Uh, for example, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way on this. Uh, it allows us to attest uh, the uh, neo-Hobbesian claims uh, for the economic value of centralization. Uh, it also uh, allows us to test uh, various theories of the causal relationship uh, between uh, regime characteristics um, and economic change. The uh, political and economic development of Greece uh, is what I'll trace um, in the at least fairly uh, long run, a run uh, that goes from about 1300 BCE, the end of the uh, Bronze Age, uh, to 1900 uh, CE. Uh, and we'll be looking at two different periods. Uh, core Greece, um, that is the territory of the Greek state in about uh, 1890, and then the more extended world of the Greek city-states that covers uh, much of the uh, Mediterranean. So in the map below, uh, the gray area is the extended Greek world um, in about uh, 323 uh, BCE, just at the, uh, uh, before um, Alexander's conquests uh, were consolidated. So here's the basic story. Um, if we look at core Greece um, for economic uh, development, population and consumption estimates from 1300 BCE on uh, the left uh, to 1900 CE on the right, uh, the dark bars um, uh, consumption and the light bars population. Uh, once again, we're going to be looking especially at this classical uh, period and uh, uh, the um, uh, about the middle left. Um, uh, so if we put these two together, uh, we uh, uh, multiply consumption um, times population. That is the basic story behind rise and fall. Um, that's what we're uh, interested in trying to um, uh, explore and explain, especially this period in the classical area, era, early Hellenistic era um, of efflorescence. Uh, if we compare it to the what we can call the pre-modern normal, that is uh, the conditions of consumption and population for this core area of Greece uh, from, once again, uh, the late Bronze Age to early modernity, uh, the classical era stands out as quite dramatically different uh, from uh, any other period in Greek history. Uh, looking at the shape of the Greek world, the Greek world is a, a, a mass of uh, city-states um, uh, around uh, the Mediterranean. Once again, we can document about uh, something over a thousand of them. Uh, the populations uh, of these uh, uh, city-states vary considerably. Uh, most of the Greek uh, city-states are very small, um, so we have a population range uh, in these uh, uh, categories of uh, polis, uh, categories one through seven. Uh, the very small ones uh, are, uh, make up most of the uh, Greek city-states. But if we look at the actual population of the Greek world, it is distributed um, primarily into mid-size uh, and larger states. So about two-thirds of Greeks uh, lived in relatively large uh, city-states rather than in the uh, very small ones. So if we look at the distribution of the Greek world, um, we can now uh, sort of Put, we can graph it um, uh, on the uh, 
uh, left side, uh, we have the numbers uh, of polase, and then on the right side, either the size um, in the uh, top graph or the uh, fame, the uh, amount we know about these uh, estates uh, on, the, on the right. Um, uh, the uh, basic story is, is that, once again, most Greek city-states are small and obscure. Um, uh, the history of Greek city-states tends to focus on the very few that are large um, uh, and very well known, but the real history of the Greek world, if we want to actually understand how this ecology works, um, is a uh, history of integration of small and large states alike, as Herodotus noted um, in the 5th century BC. So we want to measure economic change over time um, by looking at some proxies, uh, uh, both uh, 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 these uh, change over time proxies like demographic growth, size of houses, uh, supply of coin money, um, infrastructure, and then we want to be able to compare the Greek world uh, at the top of this period of economic efflorescence um, uh, in terms of population density, urbanization, um, income, uh, and inequality. Uh, so uh, this is change over time, demographic growth. Uh, if we look at just core Greece, uh, we move uh, from the uh, nadir uh, uh, after the collapse of the Bronze Age in about 1000 BCE down to 300 B uh, BCE, uh, a rise from about 300,000 to about 3 million people. We look at the entire Greek world, we're up to about 8.5 million people. This is an extraordinarily um, uh, steep rise for a pre-modern population. Um, uh, if we if we look at uh, the actual kind of um, uh, conditions of life for these uh, people living in the Greek world, bigger houses um, uh, starting in about 800 BCE down to about 300, we see a dramatic rise um, uh, in the size of houses. Um, uh, uh, dramatic rise, even if we only look at the floor plan, uh, much more dramatic um, if we assume, as I think we must, that many of these houses had uh, second floors. Uh, if we look at the supply of money, there's a great deal more uh, money available um, uh, for the Greek world. If we move from the 6th century to the 5th century, many more uh, coins showing up in coin hoards, um, uh, many more total uh, coins and uh, uh, many more hoards. Uh, and the actual size of these hordes um, uh, is increasing uh, over time. So we get um, uh, bigger uh, pots of money. So if we, get, uh, if we, if we study the um, uh, movement of uh, minting uh, over time, we can look at this uh, uh, across the Greek world um, uh, by uh, sp uh, uh, tracing um, the spread of the practice of coining silver. Uh, we can look at the uh, change in over time of uh, investment in infrastructure, uh, focusing uh, here on uh, city walls. Uh, once again, going from about 900 to 300, we see a dramatic uh, increase in infrastructure investment. And once again, we can track this, we can map this across uh, the Greek world. If we uh, study these uh, proxy or sum up all these proxy indicators, the basic uh, uh, point is that everything is going in the same direction. Everything we look at um, is dramatically greater um, in the Greek world by 300 BCE than it had been um, several hundred years uh, earlier. Uh, the aggregate growth probably 15 to 20 times over um, per capita consumption probably doubling um, over this period. Uh, if we now begin to look at some of the comparative um, uh, examples, uh, uh, population density um, uh, is up to uh, about uh, 44 persons per square kilometer, um, very similar to what it was in Holland um, uh, or England. Um, uh, this is looking at the Greek world in about 323 uh, BCE. Uh, if we look at uh, urbanization, I think it's even more surprising. Uh, the Greek world uh, was highly urban. Uh, if we look at the percentage of uh, the population living in towns of greater than 5,000 people, um, uh, Hellas, uh, the Greek world, uh, about a third uh, of all Greeks living in these relatively large uh, uh, towns, uh, compared to, say, uh, about 11% in the Roman Empire, about 12% in France in the 18th century. Holland. Uh, in the 17th century, somewhat more densely uh, urbanized, but uh, England uh, uh, less so. Uh, England and Wales not uh, as densely urbanized as the Greek world until um, the very beginning of the 19th century. 
So uh, although uh, we have a more densely uh, populated, urbanized uh, area uh, population, uh, we also have uh, a healthier population. So if we look at uh, the example of um, how uh, people are how long people are living based on their skeletal remains, they're actually living longer. Um, uh, so unlike uh, other periods of human history in which we see urbanization uh, correlated with uh, a higher death rate, the uh, Greek world seems to be correlated with um, people living longer. Uh, if we look at uh, real wages, um, uh, the uh, uh, Athens um, uh, in the 5th century and the 4th century BC, the only two real relevant uh, data points that we have uh, for the Greek world uh, before the Hellenistic period, uh, it is a, a real standout. This is uh, data that is collected by my uh, colleague, Walter Scheidel, uh, looking at uh, real wages for laborers between the 18th century BCE on the far left, once again, somehow the uh, translation has wiped out the numbers, um, uh, and the 18th century CE on the right. Uh, the point is, is that uh, most of the uh, population um, of, the of, of where we can actually trace um, uh, uh, real wages, most people are living very near subsistence um, until the uh, 15th and 16th century on the uh, right side of the graph. Athens uh, in both the 5th century and the 4th century is a standout. Um, and now, no reason to, uh, the, what this would have shown, um, uh, were the uh, presentation working correctly, uh, is that uh, the uh, pay rate um, in Athens, um, uh, if we reduce it to wheat wage, is virtually identical um, uh, to that of uh, Holland in the 16th to 18th century. So uh, conditions of uh, low inequality um, uh, in Athens, uh, if we look at uh, the uh, Gini uh, coefficients, uh, Athens looks not radically uh, dissimilar from the uh, Roman Empire, uh, but the shape of the Lorenz curve um, is quite different. Uh, we have higher uh, uh, per capita uh, median uh, uh, citizen consumption, middle class citizen consumption in Athens, uh, uh, higher consumption by elite citizens um, in Rome. Uh, and then if we look at the inequality extraction ratio, um, uh, this is uh, Milanovic and Williams' uh, work to try to uh, figure out how much of the total um, uh, income can be extracted uh, by elites. Uh, Athens is surprisingly low. Low is good, uh, just as in a Gini. Um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, quite similar to England and Wales um, in the 17th century and much higher um, than the median pre-industrial uh, society. So uh, inequality uh, can only really be traced um, uh, in terms of Gini coefficients for Athens, but if we want to look at the whole Greek world, um, we can look at the size of houses, uh, and here we can see that the uh, smaller houses, 25th uh, percentile in the size, uh, is surprisingly uh, tracks um, the larger houses, the 75th percentile, suggesting that inequality across the Greek world um, is lower than uh, we might have initially expected. And another blank slide that would have simply uh, summarized the comparisons uh, between uh, early modern England um, and uh, Holland and uh, fourth century Greece. Uh, basically, it was just the uh, evidence I've already shown you. Uh, the point is, is that the Greek world uh, appears to be surprisingly close uh, to the most advanced uh, of the early modern uh, economies that we know about. These are, of course, England uh, and Holland in the early modern period, the two standout pre-modern economies. So how to explain it? Um, uh, I have uh, uh, two uh, hypotheses. It can be rolled into one. Uh, fairer rules, that is more equal and um, open access, and fiercer competition uh, within the market-like ecology of states incentivize capital investment both by individuals um, uh, and by states, um, investment in human capital, social capital, and financial capital, and also rewarded innovation, um, once again, by individuals and states, uh, while simultaneously lowering transaction costs. 
So uh, this is the, uh, base, the, the story of the book um, uh, in a slide. Uh, if we start uh, with nature, uh, a world um, uh, with certain uh, spread of geographic resources, certain climate, uh, with a uh, beginning with a collapse at the end of the Bronze Age, as we move into uh, the period of the Greek city-states, uh, we see the development of fair rules, competition, driving capital investment, innovation, specialization, and ultimately efflorescence. Well, there are various predictions that arise um, on the basis of these hypotheses, refinement of uh, these rules, um, failure of states that do not uh, uh, follow the path of convergence onto these more adaptive uh, institutions, the expansion of the Greek world, and more specialization. Uh, looking just briefly at democracy as one uh, example of uh, what's going on, we see in Athens uh, frequent innovations uh, and refinements in various uh, domains. We see uh, some institutions are quite stable, and we see Athenian institutions being adopted uh, by other polis. So the idea is, is that democracy is one example of these fair rules, um, or fairer rules for some people anyway, uh, that uh, make for the potential uh, for higher investment in human capital and lower transaction costs. Uh, if we look at uh, democracy, is it in fact an advantage uh, for a Greek state to adopt democracy? The example of Athens suggests that it is. If we correlate state capacity, which is the solid line, with uh, a democracy, which is the dotted line, we can see that basically in the democratic era, um, we have higher state capacity, um, uh, quite uh, closely correlated with higher uh, democracy, um, uh, and that uh, democracy also seems to be able to survive shocks. Um, uh, to bounce back after severe performance failures um, at the, uh, with uh, plague uh, and with uh, the Laosian War, um, uh, and then to, uh, to survive various uh, other shocks. So uh, if we look at the transition um, uh, toward uh, and away from democracy, um, uh, once again, democracy it tends to be winning out. Uh, the transitions uh, away from uh, uh, oligarchy and toward democracy uh, are, not, uh, are not massive, but uh, overall uh, oligarchy is losing ground uh, to democracy across the Greek world. And uh, if we look at actual regime counts, the numbers uh, of uh, instances of a certain sort of regime, democracy, uh, oligarchy, and tyranny, uh, the green line being tyranny, you can see sort of running, uh, runs up and down. Um, the red line being oligarchy runs up uh, and then runs down. The blue line of democracy um, uh, runs up and stays up. So once again, the uh, thought is that the democracy is turning out to be relatively adaptive. We can do the same kind of story with other kinds of institutions which have the same feature of making uh, easier access, open access, more fair access to institutions, for example, um, uh, federalism. So there's much more uh, to be said, of course, uh, and uh, the book uh, does say a good deal more about, for example, motivation of citizens, um, the foundations of social cooperation, about how information exchange uh, works uh, uh, as a mechanism to enable city-states uh, to extend uh, citizenship and to uh, organize uh, what is known. Um, institutional design, uh, we have examples of both design success and design failure, and once again, uh, uh, adapt, uh, ad more adaptive forms uh, of institutions being uh, uh, spread across uh, the Greek ecology. Um, uh, I haven't said anything today uh, about the political fall, how come the Macedonians took over, um, uh, and it's in the title. Uh, uh, I owe you an explanation, but I don't have time to give it uh, at the moment, uh, uh, nor uh, uh, have I time in this talk um, uh, to tell you about uh, how uh, economic and political change um, uh, might be explained in the post-classical era, um, but for all of that, uh, my uh, publisher will be happy for me to say, buy the book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the lecture. Um, since the salience and the ideologies and thoughts in ancient uh, Greek world. I'm interested in if there are any available data about uh, public opinion, 
and uh, polarization of ideology or things like that that are measurable and applicable in this political science. So, uh, so, the, so the, the bit, your question is basically about, about political ideology. And about, yeah, I, uh, this book is not specifically about ideology, although I think it, ideology is a very important part of the overall story. Um, I had uh, uh, written quite a bit about ideology in some of my earlier work, and I do try to uh, bring some of it forward. Ultimately, um, the key ideology is that is one of uh, citizenship. Uh, an ideology that says that citizens, um, uh, that is, uh, free native males, ought to be treated relatively equally, uh, at least um, as political actors, uh, and that they uh, ought to be given uh, the basic resources uh, uh, to be able to do that. So I think that's the core ideology um, uh, that informs the, the Greek world. Uh, thanks for a terrific overview of how you published early. Uh, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to the large argument in the book. Uh, I want to just make a couple of observations and ask you to respond. Um, I know you can't do everything in a half an hour. Uh, what I really like about this project especially is that um, uh, it's something that you have in common with a lot of good, interesting trends in ancient history now, which is to really think in, uh, seriously about the fact that Greece was a collection of independent cities that, that stretched from Gibraltar to the Black Sea and that Greekness was not a national character aligned with a state. And it's, it cannot be stressed enough when we're talking with our political science colleagues that that is, that, you know, that Greekness does not align with the notion of a, of a, of a national state, but that it, it stretched so broadly. So what I'd like to do is ask you to say something about two, two um, things that you didn't, mention in, your, in the presentation, but I'm sure in the story, and that is in that particular period that you have so many interesting things to say about, there was tremendous um, movement of populations, there, uh, um, uh, what we used to call colonization, but we don't necessarily have to call that, that anymore, maybe, I'm not sure if you want to call it that, but just tremendous uh, movements of, uh, of, of populations. Um, who, uh, and uh, in all sorts of different ways, and also, of course, um, the slave economy. That's yeah. just, I mean, you didn't mention it. I'm sure you have an answer, but I'd love yeah. to hear how it fits in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, um, if we think about moving from uh, core Greece, uh, so the area uh, of the um, earlier, uh, where, where the Greek uh, civilization first emerges, basically where the Greek state is now, um, across the uh, Mediterranean, uh, the story really is one of colonization. Uh, and colonization is happening because the Greek uh, uh, form of the polis turns out to be readily exportable. Um, populations are rising already by the 7th century, 8th century, and 7th century. This is pushing uh, a colonization, and colonization is working uh, because the polis form turns out to be readily adaptable to these other places. Of course, uh, there are winners and losers. Uh, people are being pushed out um, uh, in some places when the Greeks are coming in, or they're being, um, uh, as it were, converted. Uh, they're uh, becoming part of uh, the Greek world. So, uh, yeah, slavery is uh, the other big story, uh, and slavery, I think, is at least uh, uh, in a, the most obvious way to be accounted for by the real labor demands of the Greek world. The Greek world is expanding economically faster than they are able to supply uh, uh, enough labor to fill in the economy. And so therefore, it's really demand for labor that is creating uh, this, uh, uh, creating new forms, uh, in fact, of, uh, of chattel slavery, um, and causing reorganization um, of states uh, in the, on the periphery of the Greek world so as to meet that demand. Uh, so that slavery really is, perversely, um, in a moral sense, uh, uh, indicative of the remarkable success uh, of this citizen-centered system of political organization in creating a growing economy um, that uh, uh, requires uh, uh, more labor than it can uh, supply internally. Is that why you use the Dutch as your 
model in the well, world? Well, yeah, I mean, this is, yeah. and once again, this story is really what meant to be that I'm telling today is meant to be one of um, how do we explain uh, or how do we first use data to track um, uh, economic change over time. Uh, there's a whole nother story to say uh, wh who were the winners and who were the losers, um, uh, what are the goods and what are the bads um, of that uh, economic change over time. So yes, the Dutch world is a propos uh, in that it's spectacularly um, cultural efflorescence, spectacular economic efflorescence when we're looking um, uh, at the Netherlands, but of course there are some real losers um, uh, as the uh, uh, Dutch uh, expand into the world. Uh, thank you. I'm, um, I'm a professor in CIDE in Mexico City. I, uh, I study uh, nothing related to this. I study Latin American elections and American elections uh, using formal theory. Uh, and I, I love this Empire series that, that, that are new because it really allows us to, uh, to expose ourselves to something that is very different and new. Uh, my question is, um, you, you commented on um, the literature, the economics literature that study institutions. Uh, and uh, what this theory, what the, a, lot, a lot of these um, uh, historian or economic historians are doing is studying, the, as you said, these institutions uh, in the 1500s, uh, in order to, uh, but they do so in order to try um, to explain uh, economic conditions today. Uh, so I was wondering if some of the, um, if you've tried to, you have tried, I mean, and uh, understanding Greek history is really interesting per se, but I was wondering if you're trying to do some of the exercises that they're trying to do, which is trying to, exp to use some of these great, so some of these in institutions in the Greek world, such as democracy or slavery uh, or economic growth, trying to explain things that happened later, many centuries later. Right. So what I, what I, what I cannot do um, is some of the kind of things that economists have been doing recently, uh, and that is saying that if we look at, for example, uh, uh, the um, uh, various uh, differences in parts of Africa from which um, uh, there were intense um, uh, uh, slaving operations and then that there were not intense slaving operations, what's the long-term economic impact of that? So there's such a break at the end of antiquity uh, that, that I don't think there's any meaningful uh, way to say that uh, Sicily um, uh, would be different uh, uh, than, uh, say, other parts of North Africa because Sicily had a history of Greek city-states and other parts of North Africa did not. I think what it's useful for um, is an out-of-sample test um, for um, hypotheses uh, that only have been tested in uh, more contemporary uh, settings. So if you think about the um, really central questions about what's the role of democracy um, in economic growth, that's you know, one of the, the big questions currently in social science. Um, we can test that uh, against uh, various contemporary uh, uh, states, um, contemporary histories. Uh, I think it's useful to be able to test that outside of the world in which you've had, for example, the development of the new world and the um, uh, 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 a technological and scientific change in certain parts of the world. Um, so uh, what I tend to think is it's not very useful for things that would be nice to be able to study, but I don't think we can, um, that is direct uh, uh, tracing uh, uh, of the impact forward to now, um, but I think it's very useful um, because it is um, so different. It is, as it were, trapped in amber um, as a historical period uh, with its own logic. Uh, we can ask, do the theories uh, that social scientists are uh, developing now, which are meant to have general application, they're not meant to be just theories that are good for, um, uh, say, the you know, 18th century and forward, we can test these uh, in the ancient world and ask whether um, they hold up or don't. Um, so I noticed that you used um, Hansen 2006 for your uh, population estimates. Is that what that? Uh, I'm sorry, the, I used um, the Hansen article from 2006. Oh yeah, for yeah, the Hansen 2006, okay. right? Yeah, I'm looking at that right now, and he says that um, there's a 140 to 160 percent increase. I mean, the population of ancient Greece in the classical time versus um, 1900 would be 140, 160 percent more, um, which is an extraordinary number. Um, and it kind of implies that there must be some kind of 
higher productivity growth um, in the ancient world than what you had, and especially agricultural productivity. Um, most models for uh, modeling pre-modern economic growth, they generally kind of do a little, you know, you know very well, a kind of a formula of labor and land and, you know, capital productivity growth and agricultural growth. Um, and so when I'm looking at your, your kind of statement, you're saying this is an intensive growth that we're seeing in um, Greece, that you're having this productivity growth happen over the Hellas states. And I'm, I'm wondering, is this, is this a necessary explanation for this? Because we're starting in the dark ages when pretty much everyone acknowledges you have a population low. Um, and most of the time in Holland and England, they attribute the economic growth to um, increasing, increasing agricultural productivity. Um, but there's not a lot of technological advances in Greek time, and we do know that land increased quite a bit because you have this go from core to this greater Hellas. So could that, absent the uh, institutional changes or absent the other changes you talk about, could this increase in land account for by itself the, the economic growth that we talk about and the keeping this high standard of per capita? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that the, the real story um, is one of specialization. Uh, so basically when the Greeks expand into Italy, they expand into an area with, um, that has the potential, or into southern Italy and Sicily, um, has a potential for really um, uh, a high production of grain, um, uh, especially wheat. Uh, uh, Greece is not um, a particularly, core Greece is not a particularly effective uh, area to grow grain. Um, uh, but, so what we see is uh, the development of local specializations uh, of uh, relative advantage based on the recognition uh, that you can grow intensely a lot of wheat uh, in Sicily. You can grow other things, olive oil, wine, but you can also have manufactured products, cultural products, and so on in uh, core Greece. Uh, and uh, the, as in the case of England um, and Holland, the real story is partly um, intensification of agriculture, but also um, exchange and specialization, both in the agricultural and in the non-agricultural uh, sectors of the economy. So I think that really the, the big story is why would individuals and states have an incentive to begin specializing um, in certain uh, economic sectors. Uh, in, uh, and uh, I think the answer to that um, is that people have uh, a good reason um, to believe that their investments uh, are, in fact, uh, are relatively safe. Uh, the reason their investments are relatively safe is the institutions um, are uh, relatively fair. And the competition is uh, uh, very fierce. Thank you for the lecture. Um, I, my question is very kind of straightforward. Uh, you were talking about, you were discussing the correlation between state capacity and democratic institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, would you mind elaborating on that relationship a little bit and how you measured state capacity? Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, so uh, the slide here uh, is taken from uh, some of my earlier work uh, that, special, uh, that, that focused really on Athens per se. Uh, the uh, capacity um, uh, is an aggregate of uh, military mobilization rates uh, and uh, uh, infrastructure investment, especially um, uh, public buildings, uh, and welfare provision, um, uh, the uh, uh, things like um, uh, uh being able to pay uh, 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 orphans, uh, war orphans. Um, so basically, those, those are the three things in capacity. Democracy um, uh, is an aggregate uh, of what percentage of the adult male population um, is an active citizen. Um, to what extent does the citizen assembly have actual say in government as opposed to uh, uh, elite uh, uh, institutions um, and rule of law. So uh, these are all estimates, um, uh, but I can uh, justify why I peg it at whatever point I do at, uh, at each, uh, at each, uh, for each of these two-year intervals. Thank you very much. In the case of early modern Europe, part of the uh, growth is accumulation by exploitation. By, by, by exploitation, by exploiting America, especially South America. Is there a similar 
situation in the case of growth in the Greek uh, world? Yeah, I think that at least uh, a part of the story of growth um, uh, is, I mean, the, the expropriation is the expropriation of labor, right? So that's, uh, as I was um, uh, saying earlier, uh, the large numbers of slaves that are imported into the Greek world from the non-Greek world uh, is because uh, of demand uh, for labor, uh, but I think that you couldn't have sustained growth like this uh, without um, uh, bringing in that. Uh, uh, those, uh, uh, that, that, that outside labor. Um, on the other hand, I think a great deal of this growth is simply um, uh, efficiencies, uh, Smithian uh, kind of efficiencies from uh, specialization and exchange. Um, uh, and then we get uh, Schumpeterian kind of uh, efficiencies because uh, the new innovations are actually pushing out um, uh, inefficient uh, ways to, uh, to do things as well. Um, so uh, I think it really is uh, a lot of the growth um, needs to be explained both um, through uh, exchange and through adaptation and uh, what uh, Schumpeter would call uh, creative destruction, but there certainly is um, uh, expropriation of the labor of, uh, of, of non-Greek peoples. Okay, so I think unfortunately that we are out of time, but uh, please join me and uh, give me Professor Ober a round of applause. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm sorry about the slides, um, but one more reason to get the book. <laughs>